Thank you, Jim. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Congratulations to Ralph on this 50th anniversary of Unsafe at Any Speed, and uh, thanks for this, uh, yes, and thanks for this opportunity to be here at this time along with so many others. First, I want to show you a very short video about our organization. These are the core beliefs of the Indian Law Resource Center. For more than 30 years, the center has been a global force challenging and building legal frameworks to enhance the lives of indigenous peoples. One of the major causes of the economic and social ills within native communities is the unfair legal rules that apply only to native peoples in the United States. We have taken on cases on behalf of the Timbusha Shoshone and the Mohawk Nations and others with the goal of changing some of these laws. We also seek to strengthen sovereignty rights so that tribes can better protect their people. This is more critical now than ever. One in three Native women will be raped in her lifetime, and three out of five will be physically assaulted. The center's hallmark work is related to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We wanted to be sure and we wanted to establish legal rules that would make it clear that indigenous peoples really do own their land. They really do have full and complete legal rights to those lands, that they have rights that can be protected in the courts, rights that are protected by definite rules of law that can't just be thrown out or ignored by courts or countries and their governments. The declaration was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. And as you know, in April, we announced that we were reviewing our position on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And today I can announce that the United States is lending its support to this declaration. This is just a snapshot of the work coming out of both the Helena, Montana and Washington, D.C. offices. We at the Indian Law Resource Center are experts in Indian law, working to protect and preserve indigenous peoples and their communities. Our ultimate goal is to make positive contributions that will have lasting effects. Visit www.indianlaw.org. Well, I'm not sure that I actually belong up here with the uh, kinds of organizations and advocates that have been assembled here. We're an American Indian organization and we just work hard and worry about our funding and wonder what we can do to improve the future for Indian and Alaska Native peoples. I suppose in that basic way we're a lot like many of these other organizations, but let me try to give you a little bit more detail about what we do. What we do is we provide legal representation to American Indian and Alaska Native nations and tribes, and I mean uh, Indian nations and tribes in Central and South America as well. We are funded just by foundations, individuals, and a few Indian nations. We don't take any government money. It's a matter of our integrity and independence. And as a result, our budget has always been pretty small. It's less than 1.5 million per year, and that's only in recent years. We have an office, as you heard, in Helena, Montana. That's our head office, but we also have an office here in Washington, D.C. that's headed by my partner of uh, some 35 years, Armstrong Wiggins. Uh, Armstrong, if you're here, raise your hand or stand up. He's done so much to, to build our program and 
When we began this work in the 1970s, Indian nations in the United States were just utterly dominated by the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. They suffered from extreme poverty. Tribes had few legal rights. That's still the case, actually, and practically no constitutional rights. Nearly all tribes were completely dependent on federal support for food, shelter, health care, and other necessities. Indians in Mexico, Central, and South America endured even worse, frequently suffering massacres, murders, genocide, and the like. Indian communities were and still are typically denied land rights and subjected to severe political repression and forcible relocation. As a result, indigenous peoples in the Americas and worldwide were disappearing along with their cultures and languages. Our human rights work affects and involve, involves thousands of indigenous peoples worldwide, though we just work in the Americas. There's an estimated 370 million indigenous peoples in at least 70 countries around the world. Now, indigenous peoples, I like to say, are American Indians, Alaska Natives, and other peoples like that. But there's a little bit more of a definition. They're peoples that inhabited a country or a region at the time before other peoples of a different culture or ethnic origin arrived and became dominant. Well, we wanted to assist indigenous nations and tribes to change the appalling treatment and the racist laws that were inflicted on them. A reasonably fair and workable legal system is always necessary for economic development and improvement of social conditions. But in the United States, that doesn't exist for Indian nations today, and the result is pervasive poverty, deprivation, and suffering. Casinos benefit really only a few tribes. Lawyers and courts had done virtually nothing to assure constitutional rights and fair treatment for Indian tribes. It was clear that we would have to do something different in order to overcome the incredibly unjust legal system and the system of federal control that had been entrenched for 150 years and still is so entrenched. We decided that we must listen to Indian nations that ask for our help and follow their decisions. We decided to work for Native peoples of the Americas, not just in the United States. Now, working for Indian nations means we were never trying to work alone. We were advising and assisting Indian and Alaska Native nations, sometimes many of them in several countries. That was important. We began a long-term strategy to overturn the antiquated and racist body of law that we found almost everywhere. We planned a long campaign of writing, education, lawsuits, and organizing aimed at changing the law. But we learned after years of work that the courts in this country were not open to any serious challenge to the legal system that affects Indian nations. The very Supreme Court that had ruled school desegregation unconstitutional also ruled that same year that the federal government is free to actually confiscate Indian tribes' property without due process and without any compensation. That's still the law in the United States. We needed an additional strategy for changing the laws. Some of the Indian nations that I was representing pointed out that they had never relinquished their rights as nations to participate in the international community. And so we began to look to the international community, to the United Nations, for ways to challenge the laws in the United States and elsewhere. The then newly, relatively newly emerging law of human rights at the international level was really promising because it condemned in no uncertain terms discrimination, genocide, the denial of cultural rights, and other wrongs. In 1976, we had the opportunity to go to the home of human rights in, the, in Geneva, Switzerland, to the United Nations there. And I suggested to the Indian nations that I was working with at the time that they consider proposing to the United Nations a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. I wrote a draft for them to consider. They did consider it. 
reviewed it, modified it, and took it to the United Nations in 1977 and proposed it to the United Nations for adoption. Our, our strategy was that by creating international awareness and pressure on the United States and other countries, we might be able to develop international legal standards about the rights of Indian nations and indigenous peoples. We might be able to change the policies and practices of countries, and we might be able to persuade eventually the domestic courts and lawmakers to reevaluate their laws and policies. We had very difficult times. Our strategies were scoffed at, in this country at least. Many people said we'd never accomplish anything. We had a staff of just five or six, and our budget was never more than a few hundred thousand dollars a year. But the process in the United Nations soon became the largest and most heavily attended human rights process in the UN's history. For the first time, the affected people, the indigenous people, were permitted to participate in the human rights process, and they were enormously effective. Hundreds and hundreds of them went to the United Nations to negotiate and uh, advocate for the Declaration. Our work on the Declaration took 30 years until finally, as you heard, the General Assembly adopted it in 2007 and the United States gave its approval in 2010. Thank you. It made a big difference because the Declaration proclaimed for the first time that indigenous peoples have the right to exist. Uh, the right to exist as distinct peoples. That was not the case before. The right to exist with their own governments, without discrimination of any kind, with the right to own their lands and resources and a host of other rights. This was a great change in the tide of history and it's changed how countries see indigenous peoples. Now, in 2014, just a little, about two years ago, we helped to win four more major commitments from the United Nations General Assembly. We won commitments to develop a permanent monitoring and implementing body for the UN Declaration, to see that it's carried into effect. We won a commitment to create new rules in the UN that will permit Indian nations and other indigenous governments to participate on a permanent basis in the United Nations. After this, we won't have to have special permission to go and fight for our rights there. They'll be there all the time. We also got a commitment to combat violence against indigenous women, which you heard about in the video. That, by the way, speaking in the video, was our senior attorney, Jana Walker, who has accomplished remarkable things in the fight against violence against indigenous women. We also <laughs> won we also won a commitment from the United Nations to do more to encourage respect for indigenous sacred sites. On the domestic front, our project on violence against indigenous women helped to win a major change in United States law, as you heard, in the, in the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. They used brilliant organizing, brilliant communications work, videos about the epidemic of violence against Native women and creative advocacy in international bodies. And they won the support of women all over the country who helped bring about a tremendous reform in United States law, returning law enforcement power to Indian governments in the United States, power to help prevent some forms of violence against Indian women. But much more needs to be done. We've litigated land claims. We've used federal courts to challenge federal government abuses and sometimes state government abuses. We've changed the United States laws in some important ways, but fundamentally, the unfair and racist legal framework is still in place, and we're continuing to challenge it. We're going to have to focus on education to educate a new generation of lawyers and judges, so we're writing materials to do that. It's going to take many more years to change the law.
assuring that the United Nations takes the necessary measures to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to see to it that countries respect these rights is another priority for our work going forward. And now we're going to have to implement the new American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples because, let me say, just four days ago, the Indian Law Resource Center staff here in D.C. and a handful of amazing Indian leaders from the Americas over here at the Organization of American States succeeded after 26 years of work, succeeded in completing the negotiations on the new American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's stronger than the UN Declaration. Now that, yes, it was a tremendous job they did and there were so few of them, but it had to be done and they did it marvelously. That declaration is expected to be approved by the General Assembly of the Organization of American States in a few weeks in June. So we're looking forward to that. The greed for Indian resources uh, seems to have grown. Uh, in recent years, much more virulent. At the same time, we're seeing a breakdown of the rule of law in the Americas, a significant reduction in the willingness or ability of countries to enforce laws or to abide by them. These two factors are extremely dangerous for marginalized peoples, such as indigenous peoples. As Indian communities have begun to assert the real legal rights that are being created, Indian leaders are being murdered in many countries. This is a very alarming development, particularly in Central and South America. They're being murdered by those who covet these Indian lands and resources. It's a very urgent situation that we must address and must stop. We hope to train more Indian lawyers and Indian leaders, especially in Central and South America, to help them defend and assert their rights. I hope that perhaps we can create, uh, I hope that we can create an Indian Law Resource Center in that part of the world. I uh, get moved by that because it's been a dream that we've been unable uh, to fulfill for many years, but perhaps we can do that soon. Fundraising concerns, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Fundraising concerns are serious. I'm worried that foundations seem to be trending toward just short-term projects. This isn't good. It took 30 years to get the UN Declaration, and it was worth it. 26 years to get the American Declaration. Serious work requires serious time. We need to educate philanthropy to be responsive. I think our greatest need, yes, we may need to look to individuals and families where foundations are falling down. For the long term, I think we need to focus more on education and modern communications work. We need to try to engender the rule of law in many countries, and by this I mean encouraging political and social systems uh, so that they are governed democratically by laws and not by the arbitrary dictates of individuals. Well, in this long-term view, I hope that we will see rich cultures and hundreds and thousands of indigenous communities thriving all around the world. But I also want to see a great body of rights, of fundamental rights, recognized for other peoples as well. This need not be just limited to indigenous peoples. I believe that most of the rights in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples should be the rights of all peoples of the world. So let's see if we can do something about that. Thank you very much.